Welcome to the 2020 commencement for Erskine Theological Seminary. Thank you for being a part of this special service this year. We aim to glorify God, to honor this milestone in the lives of our students and their families, and also to celebrate the ministry of the gospel that is going forward here at our humble institution, Erskine Theological Seminary. This is a service of worship, and even though it, our commencement this year is going across the, the internet, it's still a service of worship. It's still a time for us annually to ground ourselves in the vision and mission of our school. We are here in order to prepare men and women to fulfill the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. This service represents an expression of that vision in a real way. This is a worship service. Would you join me as we prepare our hearts to worship the living God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your only Son to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and an example of godly living. Give us grace, thankfully, to receive his inestimable benefits and daily to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 
Amen. Would you join me for the call to worship, responsively? Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord of heaven. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all you angels of His. Praise Him, all His host. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you stars of light. Together, praise Him, all you highest heavens and you waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He spoke the word and they were made. He commanded and they were created. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God as we sing together praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with unsettled hearts and conflicting emotions. As we live each day facing the pandemic, we are constantly reminded of our weakness and confess to you we have never more needed your strength. The illusion that we are sufficient apart from you has been destroyed and we bow before you. O Sovereign Lord, we cannot be together this day. But, Lord, we are confident that we are never apart from you. For you have promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. So even as we lament our physical distancing, we are encouraged by our recent Easter celebration that reminds us Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so today we rejoice in the promise that we share in his resurrection life. Now, Lord, be with us as we come together from our many locations to celebrate our graduates and their preparation for gospel ministry. We rejoice in the hard work and perseverance that brought our students to this virtual graduation. And we look forward to the day when we can gather together in one place and testify to your goodness and grace. These things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 5b to 12. The context is found in verse 1 of chapter 9. It reads, On the twenty-fourth day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. The Levites said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our forefathers in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land, for you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself which remains to this day. You divide the seas before them, so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way they were to take. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am so happy to be able to welcome my dear friend and a colleague as we serve together at First Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mrs. Kelly Stoltz is one of the most remarkably gifted directors of music in North America. And now we have the opportunity of having her as a part of our 2020 commencement services, accompanying Kelly in the Psalm 23 setting is her son David, David Stoltz on piano, and Susan Whitaker on violin. All of these were, I am happy to say, my parishioners at First Pres Chattanooga. What a joy it is to have them with us. This is the King of Love, my Shepherd is.
The New Testament lesson is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our dear Heavenly Father, you sent your only begotten Son to live the life we couldn't live and die the death that should have been ours. You looked mercifully upon us when we were still sinners, and you saved us while we were still rebels. Thank you, O God, for your love and your grace. And now we come to this place where we lift up these graduates, these who have prepared their lives to serve you in word, sacrament, and prayer as pastors, teachers, missionaries, and some in other vocations in the world bearing witness to you. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, the Good Shepherd, and so we ask that you will shepherd these who will shepherd your flock. Grant that in their most difficult hours they will know the consolation of your Holy Spirit. And in those days of success and joy, that they may be mindful that all good gifts come from Thee. Bless our faculty and staff. Bless our constituency, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, and all of the Christian communities that are represented here, and there are many. Thank you for them, Lord. It is like a magnificent mosaic. And as we stand back, we see a picture of you and your children. Heavenly Father, we pray that there may be souls saved and lives transformed as a result of these who are going forth today. By thy power lead them and grant them courage as they go forth to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And we make this prayer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is our great pleasure to welcome to the pulpit of Erskine Theological Seminary's 2020 commencement, the Reverend Dr. George Grant. I'm 
very honored to say that George and Karen are friends of mine. May and I love them. He's been such a constant friend to me and a prayer partner across the years. The former president of Coal Ridge Ministries, a man who was at the forefront of the pro-life movement many years ago and who has stood strong for the lives of unborn children even as he has sought to educate children throughout the world, including Franklin Classical School in Franklin, Tennessee. A pastor, a church planter, he is the senior minister of Parish Presbyterian Church, one of the great churches in America located in Franklin, Tennessee. He and his wife, Karen, have three children, and they are blessed with grandchildren and dogs, a lot of books, some wonderful fountain pens, and a heart that beats after God. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. George Grant. Forty-five years ago, Francis Schaeffer began work on what would become his magnum opus. He began with these words. There is a flow to history and culture. This flow is rooted in and has its wellspring in the thoughts of people. What people are in their thought world determines how they act. This is true of their value systems and it's true of their creativity. The results of their thought world flow through their fingers or from their tongues into the external world. This is true of Michelangelo's chisel, and it is true of a dictator's sword. People have presuppositions, and they will live more consistently on the basis of these presuppositions than even they themselves may realize. Presuppositions rest upon that which a person considers to be the truth of what exists. So, Schaefer says, that most people catch their presuppositions from their family and the surrounding society the way perhaps a child catches the measles. But people with more understanding realize that their presuppositions should be chosen after a careful consideration of what worldview is true. Schaefer takes the title of his book from that remarkable section of Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 33, when God calls him to be a watchman on the wall to warn the people against impending dangers that they might, in the end, cry out, how should we then live? In essence, this is what the Apostle Paul is doing in the book of Romans. Now, after 11 chapters of close theological reasoning, he comes to chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Careful, slow and precise for 11 chapters, now the Apostle Paul bursts forth in a staccato of imperatives, laying out the practical worldview implications of the gospel that he has declared. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones has said of this that here, what the Apostle Paul is asserting that there are very practical, real-world consequences to the doctrines of grace 
that he's elucidated in the first 11 chapters of Romans. R.C. Sproul says it this way, Whenever he gives us deep and profound doctrinal teaching, Paul always follows it with very specific, concrete, practical applications. For 11 chapters, he's taken us through the weightiest of doctrinal studies. But now, he ends with a series of practical applications. Now, what does it mean for our lives? Now, what should be our response in terms of our hearts, in terms of our behavior, in terms of our lifestyle? How are we supposed to react to the revelation of truth that Paul has just spelled out? In other words, how should we then live? Uh, Paul uh, tells us in verse 1 uh, that, uh, that he has a strong appeal to make. Parakaleo is a word that is uh, best translated as the King James translators do, as beseech. It means to implore, uh, to entreat, to exhort. It's a strong word. But as strong as it is, it's not the emphasis of the whole sentence. Instead, a little conjunctive word, un, translated as therefore, is the emphasis. Uh, Paul uses this word which means accordingly or or so that or so now or ergo or as a consequence uh, to say that in light of everything that he has said at the beginning, there are now brass tacks, a rubber meets the road, uh, practical implications of the gospel. He wants to declare to us that the gospel changes everything. John Piper points out that uh, the use of this word is, is, in a sense, a worldview in and of itself. He's arguing that there are uh, uh, logical progressions, linear history, that as opposed to the randomness of the Greco-Roman worldview, uh, Paul is saying ideas have consequences, not just in the spiritual realm, but in real life. And notice, uh, Paul specifies that these consequences flow from the mercies of God. This is Paul's shorthand statement for everything that he has declared up to this point. The kindness of God, chapter 2, verse 4. The patience of God, chapter 9, verse 22. The love of God, chapter 5, verse 8. The grace of God, chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 4, verse 16. And on and on. What are the practical consequences of the gospel? How should we then live? Paul answers in the rest of the chapter. Uh, First, he says uh, that uh, we should live lives of thanksgiving and consecration, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. Notice the combination of the singular and the plural. That we have bodies, but we are a sacrifice, pointing to the one and the many, the uh, richness of covenantal life uh, together. Notice, too, uh, that we are to be living sacrifices. Uh, No longer is there a need for the blood of goats and bulls. Instead, we become the sacrifices Uh, To live for his uh, glory. A sacrifice, therefore, is not something that we make. It's not something that we do. It's something that we are. For, as he reminds the Corinthians, uh, we are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. Or as he says to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ and it is uh, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. A life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. We've been set 
free, no longer in bondage to sin and death, no longer enslaved to sin and passion. We are not dead in our trespasses and sins. We are alive in Christ. How should we then live? Secondly, Paul says that we should therefore live in complete contrast to the world. Do not be conformed to this world. Literally, do not be squeezed into the mold of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewal of your minds. We're a peculiar people, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2. A chosen people set apart for his purposes. And now Paul is saying, as we align our thinking and our lives with gospel reality, uh, we uh, will be able to discern the will of God here. uh, What is good and acceptable and perfect. How should we then live? A third, Paul says, we should live lives of faith and grace and humility. This is what he describes in chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought, but instead to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Do you notice that the grace is given? The faith is given. It's, it's measured and it is assigned by the sovereign God. How should we then live? Well, Paul is saying here that we should live the same way that we received Christ. It's what he described to the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 6. In the same way you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. How should we then live? Fourth, Paul says, this is not a solitary walk. That we're to walk covenantally in body life with an apt exercise of our gifts. Chapter 4 Uh, verses 4 through 8. Notice, again, the one and the many. Uh, We have uh, differences, and we are the same. We are individuals, but we've been made one. Uh, The church of the living God is the pillar and the buttress of truth. And this, we confess, is an exceedingly great mystery. The mystery of godliness. And what follows in verses 9 through 21 are a whole series of practical imperatives declaring that the gospel changes everything. It changes our relationships. So we're to love one another, show hospitality to one another. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice and we're to weep with those who weep. We're to live at peace with one another. The gospel changes everything. It changes our character. And we're to be patient and diligent and uh, honorable. Uh, We're to uh, overcome evil with good. And then the gospel changes our approach to holiness and sanctification. And we're to abhor what is evil. And we're to serve the Lord. We're to rejoice in hope. In other words, the gospel changes everything. How should we then live in view of God's mercy? Uh, we should not conform ourselves to the world, but instead hold out the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is what you're called to. This is what you are to proclaim. The world is looking for answers at this moment. And you know, and I know, those answers are not found in a a, a lifting of the lockdown. They're not found in stimulus checks. They're not found even in the finding of vaccines or uh, immunities. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what changes everything. This is what the world is desperately hungry for. Francis Schaeffer ends his magnum opus with these words. 
If we ourselves bear the central mark of worldliness in our generation, we cannot at this moment in history be the voice that we should be to our poor and fractured generation. We are not only to know the right worldview, the worldview that tells us the truth of what is, but we are to consciously act upon that worldview so as to change the world. The gospel changes everything. As you go forth from this place to all of the places of your calling, I appeal to you. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That is what this poor, fallen world desperately needs. You've been equipped for it. You are called to it. Now, let the church be the church. Go forth and declare good news, glad tidings, great joy. My brothers and sisters, this is a glorious day of new beginnings. God bless you. As we come to the 2020 Student Awards, it is my honor to recognize the seminary students selected by the faculty to receive these awards for graduating year 2020. We begin with the Zondervan Awards. Zondervan Publishing House Awards are presented to the first year language students who do the most outstanding work in the biblical languages. The award in theology is presented to the student for their outstanding achievement in the study of theology. These awards consist of the certificate and at least one reference work. The Zondervan Award in Biblical Greek goes to Justin Keith McCurry. The Zondervan Award in Biblical Hebrew goes to Kyle J. Kiesling, Jr. The Zondervan Award in Theology goes to Martha Margaret Cotton. Congratulations to each of you. And now, the second award is the Ray A. King Church History Award. Established in 2004, in honor of a former professor of church history, the Re A. King Church History Award is given to the student who does the most outstanding work in church history courses. The award consists of a plaque and a cash prize. This year, the Re A. King Church History Award goes to Gregory Francis Delaney. The Bruce G. Pierce Award for Christian Leadership was established in memory of a student who exemplified Christian humility, service, and leadership. Bruce tragically lost his life in an automobile accident in 2000, just weeks before he was to graduate. The award, consisting of a plaque and a cash prize, is presented annually to the graduating master's student who most completely integrates a spirit of Christian servanthood with principles of Christian leadership. This year, that student is Judy Smith Irwin. The D. James Kennedy Institute 
Award for Missions goes to the student who has demonstrated faithfulness in applying seminary studies to pastoral ministry, missions, and personal evangelism. There is a cash award, certificate, and fellowship, and admission into the DJK Institute of Pastoral Residency. This year, the award goes to Alan Wesley Martin. Congratulations to all of you. And now we have the honor of welcoming the Reverend Dr. David Smith. Dr. Smith is chairman of the Seminary Committee and part of the Board of Trustees of Erskine College and Seminary. Dr. Smith. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to congratulate you 2020 graduates. You are to be commended for all your diligence and perseverance in reaching this very significant and worthy milestone. Your diligence and perseverance in completing your studies has no doubt taken place under various challenges and difficulties that are part of each of your lives in unique ways. No doubt most of you have had to overcome obstacles that you and the Lord alone know of. Your having reached this point is a testimony to your own endurance and desire, but above all, of God's grace, mercy, and faithfulness. And all these things I dare say are true for each and every graduate of each and every class at Erskine Seminary. But this year you deserve the highest congratulations for persevering through what will likely turn out to be one of the most remarkable periods in American history. If the rigors of final coursework and examinations were not enough, your lives and labors were thrown into a tailspin with the outbreak of COVID-19. And yet here you are to graduate. So congratulations. As you face the future days with hopes of various ministry pursuits, may you be reminded that the God who brought you to Erskine, who brought you through Erskine, will now take you beyond Erskine and remain with you through all your ministerial service. Again, congratulations. We come to the conferral of degrees. There is no difference of authority in the conferring of degrees by online. My desire is to make this a memorable event for you and your families. There is no higher calling than to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus, whether as a minister of word and sacrament or the noble work of education, or indeed applying your learning to another vocation. God has called us to such a time as this. Erskine Seminary graduates of 2020, you have been called to this place by God. Whether you studied in residence, online, or a hybrid of teaching and learning modalities, you were prayed for, you are loved, and you will always be cherished as sons and daughters in Christ by the doctors of the church at this place who were your professors. Do not forget their labors. Pray for them. Remember your seminary in your prayers. Remember your seminary in your stewardship. This is your school. We are forever connected to you by our common bond in Christ and also by our relationship to this venerable institution that was founded in 1837. I call to your memory that each of you were sustained by Almighty God during this period of study. You were supported by your dear families and your friends men and women, you have pursued and completed a rigorous program of study that has included the study of the Holy Scriptures, the ancient biblical languages, theology, 
the nature and practice of pastoral ministry, history, courses that explore the human condition, the divine plan of salvation, and study upon Almighty God Himself. Go forth then in His strength, with the love of Jesus Christ and His Bride, the Church, and a heart for the lost, the broken, the wounded, the outcast. And go in response to the great commission of Jesus Christ and in the highest standards of teaching and learning in the Church. The Dean of the Seminary, Dr. R.J. Gore, has presented these candidates as meeting all the requirements for their respective degrees approved by vote of the faculty. President Robert Gustafson, I present to you these candidates for the 2020 class of Erskine Theological Seminary. Accordingly, by direction of the President and Chairman of the Board, and by virtue of the authority vested by the Board of Trustees of Erskine College and Seminary as Provost and CEO of Erskine Theological Seminary, I confer upon each of you the respective academic degree for which you have been recommended with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities, and obligations appertaining thereunto. And I offer my sincere congratulations and my fervent prayer that God will guide you, protect you, use you for His glory, and bring you, your family, and all of those under your pastoral charge into the eternal kingdom of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We honor our graduates and candidates for graduation by listing their names in this video commencement and by sharing information about their hometown or ministry. Will you join us in praying for each one of these names as they appear? The Master of Arts in Practical Ministry, Beverly Diane Burgess. The Master of Arts in Theological Studies, Lee Hicks II. Stanley Albert Schrader Jr. Sok Young Yu. Godwin O. Agbo, Martha Margaret Cotton, John A. Lewis, the Master of Divinity, Darius Lamont James, Judy Smith Irvin, Samuel Francis Elsner, Alan Wesley Martin, Franklin Pruitt Jr., Janie B. Williams Andrew John DeUlio The Doctor of Ministry Degree Timothy Lee Brooks John Lodi Craven Matthew Scott Miller Timothy George Bonner Jason Allen Byers Bryant J. Castile Joseph Philip Lee Mark Raymond Levine Florica Saracut David L. Scott Terry Joe King Charles 
Ivan Pollock. Well, that's it. That's the conclusion of the commencement and the beginning of your service to the Lord Jesus Christ. We congratulate all of you and your families. And we give thanks to Mrs. Kelly Stoltz, Dr. George Grant, Dr. R.J. Gore, Dr. John Paul Marr, Dr. Mark Ross, and all of the faculty and staff of Erskine Theological Seminary. A special thanks to Robin Broom, Langley Sheely, and Tracy Spires, and the folks at Atlantic Coast Communications for their part in this video commencement. On behalf of the President of Erskine College and Seminary, Dr. Robert Gustafson, and the Board of Trustees, we thank you for being a part of this special occasion. You know, COVID-19 had plans to shut down our celebration of God's goodness. But COVID-19 has got to bow to the sovereignty of God and the glorious, indestructible gospel of Jesus Christ. That which was intended for evil, God used for good. Erskine Seminary is pleased to announce summer and fall classes through Erskine Online along with safe and creative ways of delivering the highest standards in graduate theological education, we have been, are now, and will be open for ministry. Learn more at seminary.erskine.edu. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Go in the peace of the Lord. Thanks be to God.